Roswell Flight Test Crew here at CES 2019 in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, and I'm talking to Robin Leinberger from Deloitte. How are you doing, Robin? I'm very good, Patrick. How are you this morning? I'm good. I'm good. Now, I, as it happens, have an MBA, so I've heard of Deloitte, but I don't think probably most of our drone people have. Yeah. What is Deloitte, and why are you interested in drones? Yeah, so I, first, Deloitte is, uh, is one of the largest uh, private uh, professional services firm in the world. Um, we provide, uh, mostly known by our audit brand where we provide the, the audits, the attestation to uh, the large companies that are listed on, on the various country stock exchanges. But we do, beyond that, we do tax uh, work. And then we have what we call a consulting or an, or an advisory capability. And, and where the drones come in is, is I happen to be the uh, U.S. and global aerospace and defense industry leader. And within that is the aviation business. And so while, it, while we have been looking at uh, this whole notion of the future of mobility and new transportation modalities, the, the idea of the unmanned aerial vehicle and the imagination that many have had when they've taken their smaller drones, like me and my, my <laughs> Phantom, uh, wouldn't it be nice to ride around in something like that and be able to take off and get above the traffic? So well, I think well, sign me up, first yeah. of all. <laughs> you guys are giving out tickets for that here at the show? I, I, you know, this is one to, they, they are having autonomous demonstrations, but nothing in flight. Oh. It's all on the road. All right, yeah. all right. So before we start talking, you mentioned UTM, which I think of as unmanned traffic management, and that's how drones are sort of going to get access to the skies. We've got Lance right now, so you can punch in and tell the FAA, hey, I want to use this little grid, but right. UTM is going to be more sophisticated than that. What do you... Where's UTM going from your perspective? Yeah, we, I, I agree with that. You know, it's, it's certainly a, a key. Uh, the, the way we think about it, um, versus the U in there, we're, we're sort of coining as unified uh, as opposed to unmanned because we uh, very much believe that, uh, that whatever air traffic management system of the future gets out there is going to have to be suitable for not only the, the existing aircraft that we fly, the manned aircraft as we traditionally know it, but also um, uh, drones at, at the recreational level all the way up to autonomous vehicles uh, that, that will move cargo and people around urban, suburban, and beyond. So unified traffic management. I like that a lot. So what what have you sussed out from your perspective on where we're going with unified traffic management? Yeah, the you know the couple of things that that that, that as people envision these recreational drones, smaller commercial drones, once we get past some of the regulatory barriers around weight and size and being able to uh, fly uh, beyond line of sight, one of the enablers to that is going to have to be uh, a method by which not only the drones can uh, detect and avoid other drones in some type of airspace, uh, but there's going to ha they are going to have to understand where other drones are, not just by self-detecting them, and they have to understand what their intent is so that as a, a, an autonomous vehicle gets scheduled to go up, whether it's moving people, cargo, or a sensor package, it needs to be able to tell its intent to the system, much like a pilot would do when it's flying a flight plan, that its onboard uh, location capabilities should be able to transmit that and let others know where it is at any given time, and then when it's going out of, of the system. So that then using uh, uh, the autonomous capability, AI capability, uh, data analytics in real time, then that the system, in a sense, can self-optimize so that it can take maximum use of the space at the lowest probability of having an you know, unintended consequence. <laughs> and we don't like unintended consequences in aviation. Right. Um, let me ask you th this. I mean, I, I kind of want to learn more about how all that broadly fits together. But let me ask you this, because it's near and dear to my heart, and I suspect many of our viewers as well, right. which is, what about the guy who's a recreational flyer or somebody like me who's doing, say, aerial video, where I know I'm going to be flying in this you know, quarter mile, half mile area and I'm going to be, but, but I don't know exactly what I'm going to be doing. I mean, I'm going to be making swoops over this field, or I'm going to be, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm not going to be doing totally predictable. It's not like I'm going to take off from point A, fly directly to point B, and land. Right. Will the system accommodate that more sort of free form, you know, kind of making it up yeah. as you go along flying? I think so, because, you know, a couple of things there. One is, is what you're talking about a little bit is it's not actually autonomous, that you actually are having someone control it. So there's, a, in a sense, a little bit less of a need uh, for it to be part of that. Now, to be fair, you, you've got to understand, the other vehicles have to un would like to understand if that's going to be an airspace that's going to be trafficked. 
right? But many of the, many places are not trafficked by uh, where the, these the drones or the the passenger vehicles, cargo drones, are going to want to go. So I think what we'll see is is a a little bit more of a structuring of the airspace, but at the same time with the flexibility for recreational and small commercial. Uh, operators to be able to continue to do what they do today, filing their intent, their flight plans, letting others know through the pre-planning uh, pre, uh, of that so that they'll know where they are so the system can accommodate that. Well, let me ask you, it seems to me like we need three things to make this system you're talking about work. One is we need airspace sort of at a scale that's never existed before. Now, all of our guys out there, many of them anyway, and gals, have got their Part 107 certificates, so they know their Class B, their Class C, their Class D. They know their airspace on that scale. Um, and But, you know, drones operate on such a smaller scale, I figured out that if you look at a standard, you know, 1 to 50, 1 to 500,000 scale sectional chart, the borderline for Class B or Class C airspace a 737 will cross that in three seconds at cruising speed. An entire drone mission could take place inside that line. So do we need to come up with like a whole new kind of airspace at low altitude and much, much smaller segments? Or how do we address airspace in this new world? Well, I, I do think we need to, to address the airspace at, at what granularity and, and height zone is, is exactly, I think, that what needs to be worked out based on finding uh, a way that, that provides access, flexibility, but at the same time enhances safety. Uh, and it isn't uh, necessarily the result of the, the, these vehicles being autonomous but rather the number of vehicles that will actually occur as this airspace is, uh, becomes recognized as a great vantage point, as a new transportation venue, if you will, you know, in that third dimension, elevated area. We'll just have more frequency. So we, we have to have some continue to evolve or organizing principles so that we can all co coexist, if you will, in a unified way. And something else that, that a lot of times when we get focused, as I do a lot on my drones or my, uh, uh, or my uh, customers that are dealing with, you know, passive passenger sized uh, versions of this, um, that there, there's a parallel effort going on in traditional aviation, which is looking at, at through reducing cost, a, a shortage of, of certified pilots, how do they automate the flight deck? In fact, FAA now has a term they call the automated flight deck. You know, there is a, a mid to long term journey at certainly in the cargo and likely uh, in, in the passenger space where eventually those aircraft are going to have fewer and fewer crew members and, and maybe someday even be completely automated. So this is an evolution that has to come around um, in, in, you know, without regard to the, the, the drone things that we're talking about because those could ultimately be autonomous uh, aircraft uh, automated flight decks as well. I, um, I'm just going to come out and say this. I never intend to get on a jetliner without some human beings up front. But maybe uh, that's... <laughs> I have to say as a prior Air Force officer, I, uh, <laughs> Never understood why people want to take a parachute and jump out of a perfectly good plane. Do <laughs> <laughs> you think we'll get to the point where there'll be, you know, tiny little, there'll be like class Q and Z and M airspace beyond the sort of classic, you know, B through G airspace? I think you're, you're, you're pushing my, my knowledge of, okay. of, of some of the regulations <laughs> in, in that. I, okay. I am truly a recreational drone user. All right. Fair and, enough. Fair enough. Well, I guess like, what I was thinking about is that, you know, we, to a certain extent, we as a drone industry have been given a gift in this class G airspace. Up to 700 or 1200 feet, the FAA doesn't really care what you're doing. You don't need permission to enter that airspace, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because I think, because you know, you were bordering on suicidal if you were flying your Cessna 300 feet off the ground. But three to you know zero to 700 feet is a great place for drones to operate. 400 foot AGL limit under Part 107. I did not say otherwise. But you know what I mean? Is it seems like there's there's this rich and relatively untapped resource at low altitude. Yes. So. Yeah, and and I do think you know that that is something that that airspace you then know, again I it'd be something you know come to the panel today and we can ask uh, <laughs> ask some of the we, we literally will be I'll be facilitating a, plan, a panel later today we'll have Embraer Uber and some others and you know what what is the what do they see as the operational airspace of course some of it will have the same characteristic as aircraft that in and around the, the urban vertical sure. it's going to be an upside down cone right we right. know the way but eventually it's not infinite and and it, when do they expect 
expect to level off and say it is 500, 600, 700 feet, the, the right kind of operating space for them as they look at, at cargo and, you know, a, 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 a vertical takeoff and landing vehicle that carry about a thousand pounds. You know, it's four or five people in luggage or, uh, you know, a, a reasonably good sized cargo to, to make the cost numbers work. Uh, what's the right altitudes for those things? Yeah. Well, so then the second thing it seems to me you have to have this work is that every participant in the airspace, and you've already touched on this, every participant in the airspace has to be able to tell every other participant where it is. And I'm, I'm thinking of something like transponders, ADSB. Where do you see us? Because we keep hearing about that, and I, I get it. I understand why the FAA doesn't want us going beyond visual line of sight without a transponder. I don't want a phantom to get sucked into the turbine of a plane I'm flying on any more than anybody else. Yeah. So wh where do you think we are in regards to you know remote identification, or wh where do you see that going? Yeah, without picking a, those technology, your need is absolutely right. Uh, ADSB is certainly an alternative for that. But, uh, right, and I'm just using that yeah. as kind of a... And, and absolutely, and then um, if you were to add that some of the, the promising technologies are those that are looking at how 5G, uh, so now that, um, you know, it, it's, what, that can, can you have a lot more peer-to-peer -peer, uh, communications, right? So that if you have the 5G that with a higher speed and, and all of that, that you know, is, an all, is a cost-effective, perhaps, alternative uh, to, to communicate. But, you know, you, you have to, to, to have, you know, whether it be GPS and then being able to, you know, transpond uh, wh where you are or, or, or um, squawk, as we used to say. Right, right, yeah, you got to squawk some radio uh, frequency right, and go to work. Uh, where you're at. Um, yeah, it, 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 it becomes a necessity to do that. But at the same time, you still need, um, as this happens, uh, some detection capability as well. Oh, because yeah. so inevitably, some objects will be up there that, that, that don't know where they are uh, or lose uh, Birds, for example. Lose birds, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> or we could just put yeah. transponders on all the birds, one, either <laughs> one way or the other. So then the final piece of it, and I, and I get the feeling this is the part where you're most interested, and it is fascinating, is how we're going to deconflict all this. We've got airspace, yeah. we've got machines, you know, flying vehicles that are identifying themselves, but then how do we, how do all these work together? You know, three people in a control tower is simply not going to get this done. I mean, there are going to be thousands, tens of thousands, you know, Amazon delivery drones, I'm up there shooting video, you know, people are flying back and forth in these, you know, unmanned or crude, and there's no pilot on board, but an autonomous air taxi. There's going to be a lot more things in the sky. So how do we, like I said, a human's not going to be able to manage that. So how do you see that working? Well, I think this gets back to, and I don't want to say it's just a big, massive brain, but, you know, <laughs> artificial intelligence, right, is we're going to have to have uh, computer-based technologies that can, uh, you know, uh, re uh, react and work on rules-based uh, algorithms that can operate at high speed and, and be able to manage th that many vehicles at one time. Um, it's going to be a, a kind of a layered, which is the vehicles will have some capability on their own, avoid and detect and, and work there, but also as, as the, the drone uh, or the vehicle goes up and says, I'm going here, it, it calculate a flight path, it'll be on the flight path, and you, as long as things are going well, it doesn't need to, to intervene, and if it does, then it sends the signals to, to the vehicle to be able to, to modify its uh, it's a flight path. So I do, I, I fundamentally think it, it's going to have to be uh, not assisted. It, people will assist the computers as opposed to computers assisting the people because to your point, the scale could get it and will get uh, greater than people's ability to manage it. And let me ask you, and I, I think it was Samuel Goldwyn who said once said, it's dangerous to make predictions, especially about the future. But um, where, how long do you think it's going to take for us to get to, you know, us as part 107 pilots, visual line of sight, you know, hard ceiling at 400 feet, with some exceptions, of course, um, et cetera, et cetera, to the point where, you know, I, as a small commercial operator, can inspect ten, a 10-mile 10 utility corridor, yeah. you know, clearly going, what, five minutes from now, a year from now, what do you sort of... You're you plugged know, in at the high level. What do you well, see coming I, down? You know, I, I do have the opportunity to talk, and I, certainly what we could do is come back and, and, and have you talk with one of our colleagues who's here today, with the prior FAA guy. But, you know, I get the questions a lot about when's it coming. You know, it's not really a binary outcome. It's um, an evolution, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's in different places under different circumstances it will be allowed until we have a unified air traffic management system. That then, that's the, the uh, let's call it the step function change that will enable these to go uh, beyond what we do today. Um, and then I do believe that, you know, a lot of times, and, and because we live here, we think about the United States. There are right. many other 
places that can get to that uh, around the, the world that can get to that faster because they don't have the same, let's call it encumbrances, or they don't occupy the airspace in the same way we do. Well, you think about that. Yeah, here, for example, that in Africa, for example, they've all got cell phones. They don't have landlines. Right. They sort of skipped that. I mean, it was, you know, they're big countries. They're spread out. It's very expensive to dig a trench, put a cable in it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But put up a tower, everybody's got. So you think that we may actually see other sort of less populous, less developed, you know, the U.S. has the yeah. most complex and sophisticated air traffic system in the world already. Yes. So places that don't have that may actually take the lead, you're saying. They can because they can grow up, much like you said, they can skip the landlines and plan and grow up that way and don't have, in a sense, to, to reverse engineer or, or uh, make it backwards compatible. That's a bad word. Uh, not a bad word. Incorrect. Backwards compatible right. with I, what exists. I knew what you um, meant. And we see examples already of, of medical supply delivery in some of the African countries and, and areas that don't have infrastructure. They're using a, a transitional type uh, uh, you know, take for the they actually take off horizontally because it's, you know, as you know, much more efficient. So uh, sort of a energy. conventional fixed wing, just but, like an airplane. But then they they're transitional, and they can go into vertical, let it down, and then they can return with no. Uh, they they can get the distance and the energy management because they're using a horizontal takeoff to get out lower energy requirement. Uh, Dropping in in a, in a VTOL capacity and oh, then taking out a VTOL, but but with no weight, and then go back. So we already see that, and and, and it's going well beyond visual line of sight, um, and the, to, to do that. So we, we see those things already happening in in countries that that aren't competing at volume with the other uh, other users of the space. Wow, well that's I, that is just it's such so interesting to get your perspective on this. Um, anything. Any crucial point, things I've missed? I always like to ask that. You know, I, I don't think so. I, you know, it's it's uh, th those key components around what is what are we going to do to get it unified so that you know, I, if I, there were one takeaway, you know, unmanned air traffic management system, I get it, but it needs to be unified and connected with what exists, particularly in in more developed countries like ours, where we have to figure out how to make it all work together. Right. Well, let me ask you, just unified traffic management, is that is that a term you guys have come up with? Is it a term that's being adopted in the industry? This is the first time I've heard it, but I love the idea. Yeah, well, I'm not going to say we coined it, but it is, we, we're certainly writing and talking about it like that. And it, like anything, I may have heard it somewhere and it stuck, and the next time <laughs> you say it, it comes out, and I don't want to claim credit for it, I, I could very well be stepping on some of these toes. All right, for, so from now on, guys, we're sticking with that. Unified traffic traffic management. Write that down. All right. Well, Robin, thank you so much for you're your time. Well, I know you're a busy guy at oh, CES. Yeah, we worries. appreciate you taking the time. All right. I enjoyed it. Well, thank thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. So from CES 2019 in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, this is the Roswell Flight Test Crew signing off. Thanks again, Robin. Thank you.